Welcome to another video. Um, I'm now going to show you a game I recently played over the weekend against the legendary Nigel Short and it was a, a nice honour to get to play him and as you'll see I had some great chances to defeat him. I've just returned from Ireland. I was there from Thursday of last week until Monday. I'm still recovering now and it's Wednesday because you drink far too much when you go to Ireland. I was playing the very good Bunratty Weekend Congress, but I started off doing a simultaneous in Northern Ireland in Belfast, and uh, that was on the Thursday evening. And I must say, the simultaneous was great fun. It was brilliant. So many nice people there that I was doing the similar against. I lost a couple of games, but I had a great night. Really good fun and um, very, very entertaining as well. I then drove down on the on the Friday morning, got a lift with some people to um, Bumratty, and that's when more chaos starts. It's a lovely tournament. If you want to play a weekender, come and play Bumratty. Look, I've got some pictures. It's a little touristy town in, so we say, the southwest of Ireland. Now, it's right next to this castle here. Now, check that castle out. I mean, how beautiful is that castle? You can see that castle pretty much from where you play chess. And more importantly, you have one of the oldest pubs in Ireland right next to the castle. Dirty Nellies. Dirty Nellies. There you go and get your pint of Guinness. And you can get your chowder and you can get a couple of mussels and oysters as well, if you like. But it's a, a brilliant pub. And it's one tournament I love playing each year. It's a lot of fun. Okay, you don't have to drink, obviously, but it is encouraged to have a drink during the game. Oh my words, it's the only tournament where it is encouraged. It's not fee day rated, so it is only fun. And it's just a great fun tournament. So many friendly players. Now, I think I was about fifth or sixth seed. Nigel Short was top seed, and again, Nigel doesn't need much of an introduction. He's a challenge for the World Championships, and he comes back to Bunratty on a regular basis. Uh, you had Gwen Jones, extremely strong player from England playing, Peter Wells, Cornea for Grandmaster, Mark Hebman, myself, Thomas Rendell, and Sam Collins, a lot of strong players. Now, I was doing okay. I just beat Peter Wells the day before. But in the Sunday morning, I had to face Nigel Short with the white pieces. Probably the worst time to play a game of chess in Bumratty. I'm getting my excuses out now because, as you'll see, I missed, well, as a, a great opportunity. Now, I was on three and a half out of four. Nigel was on four out of four. No one else. So if I'd have won this game, I'd have jumped into first place on my own. It was a 9-15 start. Oh, my words. That is a God, horrible hour in Ireland, considering you normally go to bed about four o'clock in the morning. But anyway, it was it was interesting. And the game was actually had some good moments to it. So let's just go over the key points. I had the white pieces and Nigel again. One thing Nigel's I've noticed extremely good at. Well, he's good at most things being Nigel short, but he's very good at picking the correct opening for the correct player. Now, in this game, I don't think a draw would have been a terrible result for him. I'm sure he wanted to win because that had kept his first place. And I'm quite an aggressive player. So after my normal Queen's Indian setup, Nigel picks a very solid opening, the so-called Bogo Indian. And he could clearly had a, a little look at this. And he's, he's just so good from his experience of playing nearly every opening at the top level in chess for so many years. He's so good at picking the right opening for the right player. And I think in this game, he just wanted to keep things very simple and very safe against me and try to outplay me later on. So the game now continued with knight bd2. This is my normal move. I try to encourage black to give up the bishop so I get the bishop pair. I think this is a safe way to get a small edge. And now Nigel played c5. Quite a rare line. And I can remember I had this maybe six years ago. It was the last time I had this against um, a Grandmaster Mazes, which I won in the European um, Union Championships in Liverpool. And I won that game. So I just followed what I did there. I went A3. Nigel gave up his bishop. Bishop takes. And Mazes played C takes D4. But Nigel played the very simple move D6 here. Now I have to be honest. At the time I was quite happy to see this. Because well I took on C5. And I assumed I should have some safe advantage. Because of my bishop pair. I mean, a very natural move here would have been bishop to c2, bishop to c3, excuse me. 
Now, I had a little think here, and I think when you're playing higher rated players, you get a little bit psyched out. And this is one of the issues I had in this game. Also, it was a morning game. Excuses, excuses, don't you? Just love them. And I thought maybe Nigel's plan here was to go something like knight c6, queen e7, and e5, if I put my bishop on c3. And then I was thinking, well, my bishop's not so great on c3. I mean, uh, there was a couple of options. I mean... But I also like the look. I wanted to win this game, at least have a go. And I thought I need to complicate things against Nigel. His experience is so good. If I play a normal kind of game, I'm not going to get any winning chances. So I need to play aggressively. And also, well, you're talking about me. I love having a little punch, you know. There's no point playing like a wimp. You've got to go for it. So I went for queenside castling. Queen c2. Nigel now went queen e7. And one idea I had here originally was to go knight to e5. And in actual fact, this is probably the best way to play. This, this, this is a very useful move because Nigel wants to put his knight on c6. And this move stops that plan. And I think knight e5, I'm not sure again, this is probably what I should have done. It was really a toss-up between this and move I played in the game. I mean, also, bishop c3 looks natural. But what put me off here was something along the lines of here... And now e3, e5 in this position. And here I wanted to play a move like knight to g5. I remember analysing this, but I suddenly saw Nigel has knight to d4 here. And again, this variation put me off. Knight to g5 would be a good positional move because if I can get control of e4, then I'm going to be slightly better because his d5 square is weak, yet my d4 square, it's symmetrical counterpart is not weak because it's covered by e3 so this is what the way i was thinking during the game but instead i mean i think knight to e5 is best i decided just to play with a strategy of castling nigel of course developed with knight c6 and here again i can play a lot of lines but i played bishop g5 and i have one particular idea in mind but i'll be honest i missed nigel's plan here nigel went h6 and now I simply took on f6 and went e3. Now, what's my idea? Well, for some reason, I completely overlooked the fact that Nigel could aim to castle queenside. I was trying to play against the bishop on c8, making it hard for him to develop this piece. And my general idea here is to go bishop d3 and bishop e4, when my bishop is extremely well placed on this square, when it's attacking the queenside and I have a nice pull on the position for example if he castled here which i think a lot of players would play without thinking simply bishop d3 and when i get my bishop to e4 how does he develop his bishop on c8 and i can even continue g4 g5 go gary so this would have been a very comfortable position but of course nigel saw the danger here and instead played bishop to d7 and around here i suddenly thought hang on a minute i i don't have any advantage here and maybe I should be trying to now go for equality, um, which I think Black's got, because he's simply going to castle queenside. And my plan of going bishop to e4 loses a lot of its strength now that Nigel has developed his bishop to d7. He can always hit that with a later f5. So I had a long think here, and I thought, well, I have a number of options. I mean, even swapping queens with queen to f4 was not ridiculous here trying to just get a very easy symmetrical game. There is one slight positional concession with my structure. Can you spot it? It's actually a bit of a subtlety, but it's a real pain in a lot of variations. It's the move A3. The move A3 weakens B3, and this is a real concern in a lot of positions. If this pawn on A3 was back on A2, my position would be a lot better, because Nigel always has ideas of something coming to B3, maybe a bishop to A4 especially if my queen moves away from protecting b3. So positionally speaking, little holes like this make a big difference. You've got to keep an eye on these factors. But of course, I should be okay with normal play here. But I thought now, right, well, look, against someone of this strength, what do you do? What should be your strategy? And I believe that against a higher rated player who likes playing a very, you know, he's a very good player, Nigel, but he, he likes simple chess. If I complicate the position and go for tactics, that's my best chance. So here I went for knight d2. Very interesting move. And the point is my knight is coming into d6 with a big check. Now, I'll be honest, I didn't fully believe in this variation 
and I don't think it's completely correct, but it is a way to try to win this game. And as we're going to see, I, I had a great chance from playing in this manner. So this is a psychological idea. And also, I know it's morning for Nigel as well. He enjoys his little glass of Pinot Grigio, or should we say a good bottle of Merlot? Uh, and he might be struggling as well. So, you know, if we're both struggling, let's complicate things because I'm more used to the alcohol. And here, well, the only challenge in the position and the only move is Queen takes F2, clearly. And now the point of my plan is twofold. I can't go knight to e4 yet because I drop e3 with check, but I go queen b3 first. And now I well I have three ideas. One is queen takes b7, two is knight to e4, and my other idea is knight to f3 trapping his queen. Now already here I think Nigel plays a mistake. He should simply just castle here. And I think in some positions with this he can get away with um with playing this move funnily enough because um after my knight comes in he has queen h4 hitting my knight and of course this way he gets his king safe it looks dangerous to him but i don't have any concrete moves here i mean okay there's a lot of options i have i can go knight to e4 take on c5 i can try to trap his queen with knight to f3 i can even take on b7 but in the cold light of day it's probably my king which is going to be more exposed than Nigel's. So I think just castles was the move I was most concerned about. In the game, Nigel played b6 very quickly, and this should be a very big mistake. Now, my first intention actually when I played this line was to go knight f3. When I'm simply threatening rook d2, goodbye, Queenie. See ya, see ya later. Um, but I suddenly realized here that um, because of our, this move a3, black can play knight to a5. And after something like queen to d3, bishop to a4. And tactically now, if I try rook to d2, the queen is trapped. Nigel has knight to b3 check. And then I saw, well, I have to take that knight. When again, it might seem good for me, but black has one way to get out of this. That's queen takes f1 check. And I briefly looked at this line. Rook takes, bishop takes here, knight into e5. But this is really... Are not very good a load of rubbish because simply f6 here and i'm just a pawn down gonna lose another pawn so then using the process of elimination as as soon as i see that knight to f3 is not possible this is something you should always use in your games eliminate options that you've calculated are not good don't look at them again and eliminate them move on to your next calculation but my whole idea with this i didn't think he could play a move like b6 because I can go knight to d6 and take an f7. And this is my whole plan when I came up with the concept of knight d2. And I think now I fall for a typical trick. You're playing against someone who you, you've watched as a kid, who you do respect in chess greatly, and you out -psych yourself. Rather than having confidence in your own ability, and I must be honest, that has dropped a bit in my own play recently because my elo's plummeted to the depths of hell and i sometimes now outside myself i think a couple of years ago i would have simply played knight to e4 which i did well hang on a minute he didn't castle let me go back excuse me um i would have played knight to e4 which i did i did play this now nigel only has one square for his queen queen h4 knight d6 check at all king e7 and my whole point when i went into this line was now to play knight to f7. And I think a couple of years ago, uh, if I was more confident, I'd have whipped this move out. Whoosh, and I just got the little whip out and start spanking him a little bit, you know. Take that, knight, take that. Shh, shh, shh. Anyway, that's a bad image. We won't go too deeply into that. But knight takes f7 is, is clearly the right move to play. It's the most aggressive move. It's the forcing move. I even calculated that it was working for me, but then I got out psyched. And I started to see other variations, and I thought, oh, hang on a minute, I've got a lot of tempting moves here. I mean, the three main choices here, knight takes f7, and of course, you should start by analysing the most forcing line first. This is a capture. Why did I analyse anything else? I should have stuck with this move. It's a typically rubbish idea. I mean, even a move like g3, thought, I thought was quite strong here, with the point he moves his queen, and now bishop g2. Completing my development... A rook's coming to f1, pressure on the long diagonal on the d file, his king's on e7. Must be great play this as well for me. So even bishop g2 was good. But the weird thing was, 
I did actually see here that knight takes f7. Of course, I'm going to see this idea. And this is what I had planned originally when my knight moved from f3. I was dreaming of this position. And I worked out here that Nigel can't play rook to f8, as he pointed out after the game as well. Because after rook to f8, um, I can now play queen to d3, as I saw, threatening something nasty on this square. He has to now go bishop to e8. And it looks like... I, he's okay here, but I did actually see this. So I can go g3. This is always a concept I should keep. And after queen f6, simply bishop g2. And Nigel cannot capture my knight, even though there's four different ways to do this, because he's going to run into either rook f1 immediately or a queen d6 and rook f1 move. And to be honest, this position you see in front of yourselves is completely winning. I mean, I would even win this blindfolded against after 20 pints of guinness against magnus carlson maybe okay but you know this completely winning and that therefore means i saw this and somehow i thought right i get very excited here and i thought well obviously he can't take this so i thought well he's got to then therefore take my knight and something like rook takes d7 king here i got as far as queen c3 threatening mate queen f6 and for some reason i decided not to play this when it's clear after I whip the queens off and go bishop e2, I'm probably winning here. I mean, I've got control. Look at my rook. Look at his coordination. Another rook coming to this square. His only positive thing is that after knight to e5, his knight sits quite comfortably. But I'm going to pick up a pawn, pick up a penguin, and pick up the game probably. So this is my chance to probably beat Nigel and to win Bumratty this year. I mean, to Nigel's credit, you know, uh, from this moment onwards, he did outplay me when I played the wrong move. I got carried away now with queen d3. And my tension was that I thought knight e5, I have a knight to f5 check, and I thought this would be dangerous to him. After pawn takes f5, queen check, king d8, queen takes knight. And I assumed this would be very dangerous with the open d file, my queen, I have an initiative here, and I don't swap queens off like I did in the last variation. And I thought, oh, this looks dangerous, let's go for this. But very superficial calculation this and in this position my opponent now played a very good move I mean, this shows his, his class he went rook to d8 and the intention is he wants to give up material to gain the initiative so i missed my chance here i went knight to d7 and after bishop e8 i win the exchange which is pretty much forced queen c2 but now after knight e5 i suddenly got a bit depressed here because i realized that even though he only has the uh, a knight and pawn for the exchange. I think I've lost all my advantage, and I'm worse here, if anything. I've got bad development. Um, my opponent's knight, Nigel's knight, is excellent on the e5 square. It can't be budged from that square. He's got ideas of queen e4 and bishop g6, which terrified me, and I just didn't like my position. Now, I play bishop e2. I try to encourage... My opponent to take this pawn on c4 when of course he's got a better ending but at least i should be okay there and i was amazed actually when nigel did take here i was much more concerned about queen to e4 here when i was analyzing some line like queen d2 and now the excellent move f6 and the bishop coming to g6 rook d1 bishop g6 and i suddenly realized here i've got a couple of checks but they're not doing anything because the knight always covers d7 for example Queen check, king f7, and the king can run away. And on the other hand, my king's in mortal danger. So in actual fact, I think this is even stronger than what was played. And in the in the game, okay, after queen d2, Nigel decided to win another pawn. And this is a safe way. And obviously, again, Black's relying on his technique, keeping things simple. It's a morning game, not complicating. And here, I should really, to be honest, be able to hold this one. Um, and uh, it, this ending, I should really hold, but I, I've really, I was a bit demoralized here. I knew that I've missed my chance, and I'm just going to show you here what I should do is simply just sit and wait. I mean, this move B4 is just a real beginner's move, and it, 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 it's, it's, it's a terrible, terrible idea. I wanted to try to get my rook into the game, creating counterplay. But not the sake of giving him two pass pawns. I mean, what a patzer. This really is absolutely awful. I've just got to sit here and wait. And I have great chances to hold because it's very hard for him to break through. 
Most all my pawns are on dark squares. He can't attack them. The only way he will be able to break through is with his king. And if I sit and wait, I can even try to encourage, put my rook on f4, and just at some point, he shouldn't be able to do this. I play b4, which is a bit of an oversight. After everything got exchanged on b4, I went rook to a1. And my plan was, I thought I was winning a pawn and getting my rook active and behind his past pawn. But I suddenly realised that after b5, I'm now going to have to... Um, he puts his bishop here, his pawn on b3. And my position is becoming really quite lost here. Because I can never get active my rook. Because... Is going to have to come back at some point to hold this pawn. And I won't go into the rest of the game. Nigel showed fantastic technique. He slowly moved his pawns up the board, got a pass pawn. And to be honest, it was just bloody depressing for me. It's my video. I want to stop it here. I'm already feeling bad. That's the end of it. Um, and I don't have the score sheet as well. And I can't remember the moves because it's island. And my brain was a little bit cuckoo. So anyway, so there we go. So that was my missed opportunity. On Bunratty, if I'd have won that game, one round to go, it would have been half point clear, thousand euros first prize. In the end, I won this much money, and that is a big zero. Uh, I lost both my games on Sunday. Not the best day for me to play chess, <coughs> but it was a great tournament. I recommend anyone checks this tournament out. People who come to Bunratty always come back. You can get a cheap flight there. You can fly on uh, from England. You can fly from other places. You've got to come. It's a really strong tournament. Lovely place to be. Beautiful place. The crack is good, and that's not the some kind of crack. That's what they say. In, that's what they say in Ireland as the joy, the happiness is good. So friendly people. You won't meet more friendly people in the world, and it's basically a fantastic tournament. So get yourself over there. I will show you a game I won next, but I had just had to get that one out of my system. And Nigel went on to win the tournament with five and a half out of six. And he won the Blitz very convincingly. So that was probably my chance anyway there. Uh, thank you for viewing the video. Please like, please subscribe. Check out my website, gingergm.com. It's going to be a new website launch very soon. If you're after the D4 DVD, I promise you it's going to be there. I'm back now. I have a little bit more time. But please, most importantly, like and subscribe the video. Um, obviously, if you don't like it, dislike if you want. I don't care. I'd rather you liked it because it make, gives me a bit more oomph to do more videos. Thank you very much for tuning in to that. And um, I'll be back again with some more videos, hopefully shortly, depending. I've got to catch up on a little bit of work as well, paid work, which is, uh, you know, we've all got to pay the bills, especially after not winning any money in bum ratty and spending a bloody fortune on Guinness. So I better, I better earn some moolah first. Anyway, cheers. Goodbye for now.